Hi everyone, I'm Haider as uh, uh, Jeff said, I lead the user services group here uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, CUDA Python. Uh, what it's going to be is a brief introduction to uh, Numba and uh, CUPY, uh, the two of the approaches you can use to use CUDA within Python. And uh, we have a set of examples that uh, I'm going to run using uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, you probably can't follow along today uh, hands-on because I think the machine's real busy on the GPU side, but you should be able to do these uh, offline uh, 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 at your own pace. Uh, they're pretty easy to follow, I think. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, so just a quick overview. Basically what Numa can do is compile uh, Python code for execution on uh, CUDA capable devices. So what it's doing is essentially running native compiled code and which is faster than the interpreted approach uh, that Python has. So, uh, and the compilation is done at runtime. So it's basically just in time uh, compilation. Uh, and uh, it, so what it lets you do is keep the flexibility of Python. A lot of people are used to uh, developing and uh, running using Python and uh, and still keep the high performance aspect of the backend uh, GPU that you're using. So uh, so that's one one approach and then CuPy is a basically a NumPy cap compatible array library. Again, it's accelerated with CUDA. Uh, the nice thing is it can use uh, the highly optimized libraries that uh, NVIDIA provides like Kublas and QDNN and, and, and so on on the back end. And so you're still doing Python, but on the back end, you're using these opt highly optimized libraries. So we'll look at examples for both of them. So in both cases, actually, it's uh, uh, the tools are designed for array oriented computing, just like NumPy. Uh, there are some restrictions, so it's not a one to one. Uh, basically, uh, Anything, especially with Numba, if there's dynamic memory allocation features on the device side, those sort of things are disabled. So that will uh, not allow some of the NumPy APIs. Uh, some of the supported ones are basically accessing the uh, the array attributes, uh, scalar uh, u funks, uh, indexing, slicing, and so on. Uh, so we'll we'll see examples of how to use this in uh, Python. So uh, first off, we can uh, uh, we can look at uh, uh, how you uh, manage the devices. Basically, that's the uh, the first step. Is uh, <coughs> you can actually list the devices. So on Expands, uh, all our work we're going to do is uh, via an Anaconda install that's centrally available. So you can see the snapshot that I have there. Uh, uh, so I do a module load GPU and module load Anaconda 3 to get the uh, uh, Python interface on the, uh, I mean, get the right Python version and the uh, uh, NumPy enabled, CuPy enabled Python there. Uh, so it's uh, quite easy to figure out like uh, 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 the devices that you have. You can just do uh, print CUDA.GPUs so the one on the left uh, and uh, upper left here, uh, basically I had asked for just one GPU on the node. So you see the manage device zero there. And on the right, uh, I had asked for two GPUs. So you ended up with the two devices. Uh, and uh, you can only use one of these contexts per thread. So you, uh, you can, you'll have to make a choice, but, uh, but it is uh, visible through the, now you can do a Numba CUDA select device to pick the particular device that you want to use. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, just picking the device, but then uh, the main part, uh, and I think Andy might have talked about this last week, uh, is the memory management. You know, try not to move too much around between the CPU and GPU uh, and, and, and all the various options that you have. So you have the, global memory, which is large and off chip and can be slow. And Numba is actually uh, set up to automatically uh, transfer NumPy arrays uh, to the device. So when you invoke the kernel, it will automatically move it. 
but there are other options like you can actually uh, do on-chip shared memory. Uh, so you could basically, uh, the function is a number dot CUDA dot shared array. Uh, you could have local uh, memory private to each thread. Uh, this is allocated for the duration of uh, the kernel. There's also constant memory that is read only and that can be cached. It's off chip, but it's still faster to do this if you have some piece that you're gonna read, uh, uh, have a read-only situation. Uh, and it's accessible by all threads. So all different options, and I think uh, if you do CUDA programming by itself without Python, you have all these options too. It's just uh, exposed in Numba too. Uh, so, as I mentioned, you can have automatic transfer of the NumPy arrays to the device. So the data is just moved uh, to the device when it's needed, and then it's actually moved back to the host when the kernel finishes. Now, this can be an issue if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of operations going on and you're moving data in and out uh, unnecessarily. Like you may have read-only arrays that you don't want to transfer back and just, uh, or the same element might get transferred multiple times, like uh, depending on what you're doing uh, on the different threads. All of that is obviously suboptimal. So, because the bottleneck in all, uh, in, in in this GPU programming is uh, is is the transfer between the GPU and the CPU. So, you want to avoid uh, minimize that as much as possible. So, the there are options to manually allocate on the device. Uh, so you can uh, create an array on the device, uh, you can move to the device explicitly, and then similarly you can copy back from the device to the host explicitly. And we, that way you don't have the automatic transfer issue. There's also the option of streams for asynchronous execution, and then once you have that, you have to have methods to synchronize and make sure that it's moved. There is also option for pin memory, uh, uh, Again, when it's uh, useful to keep the memory where you want it. So that's the memory aspect of it. Now, how do you use uh, CUDA kernels in a number? So the the GPU functions. So the kernels are essentially GPU functions that are called from the CPU code. Uh, at present, Numba I think doesn't uh, support device side launches. Uh, I have to check if anything's changed, but that was last last I checked, that was true. Uh, and these kernels don't re explicitly return a value, their uh, results are returned to the array that you're passing. And you have to specify the thread blocks and threads per block explicitly. Uh, Andy must have talked about this uh, last week about uh, the concept of blocks and uh, thread blocks and uh, grades and uh, threads per block. So, for example, you might have a kernel that is a matrix multiplication kernel, and uh, you give it the blocks per grid, and then threads per block, and uh, and then the arrays that you're passing through. So, in terms of uh, defining the kernel, this is an example snapshot of how you might define it. So, it's uh, at CUDA dot the JIT is just in time, and <clears throat> so you have the matmul. Uh, example that I was talking about. Uh, and it's a square matrix and you can uh, uh, have, uh, a, you can get the info of the shape from the, uh, uh, from the input and essentially uh, loop through and do the matrix multiplication. Now this might not be the most efficient way of doing it because actually it isn't because uh, this is the case where uh, since you didn't define the, <clears throat> if you didn't define the uh, values on the device, you're going to have a bunch of movement between the CPUs and GPUs. And also you'll have the same data moving multiple times. So the other uh, uh, other thing you can do is uh, the CUDA you know, UFUNCs, which are basically, uh, NumPy has these universal functions, which basically do all the computation on an element by element basis. Uh, so for example, if you have an array X and you do NP dot square root of X, it would do a square root of all the elements basically. Uh, so the CUDA UFUNCs are uh, 
analogous, uh, but a little bit of difference because you have to support uh, passing intra device arrays. So you could uh, you have to, and then there are options for uh, streaming for asynchronous mode, and you also can call other device functions. Like for example, if you had uh, defined uh, a function like the example we had with the MacMul, you could call that from uh, within. So the previous one was an element by element on a scalar level, but there's also a CUDA generalized UFUNCs, which can do operations uh, on subarrays, and uh, so you can have bigger blocks, basically. So that's kind of a brief kind of intro, and uh, I'm going to show you more when I uh, go through the examples on uh, how all these pieces are done. Uh, so all of the examples that I'm going to run today are going to be using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, there might be a talk further down about uh, further in the series about, with more detail about notebooks, but uh, I just want to talk about briefly talk about it. So that, since we're going to use it, uh, so we've basically developed this reverse proxy service approach uh, to secure notebooks. So what we were seeing was basically uh, if you start up a notebook on, on our uh, Say on our compute node and get a uh, URL. Uh, it's uh, it's basically uh, HTTP instead of HTTPS. So we set this up approach up, which to use our private network and then uh, present a more secure option to the user. So that's the uh, reverse proxy service that we have. Uh, so that's uh, that's on our Git repo that you can clone and. Uh, also, if you go to that repo, you'll see instructions on installing Anaconda and, or Miniconda. You don't have to do that because we uh, we already have the central install, uh, and you can use that in the example. So, roughly, this is how the uh, reverse proxy service uh, looks. Uh, so, like as a user, uh, it says Comet here. It's the same if it's Expanse. You log into the uh, Expanse or Comet login node. And you start that off. Uh, basically, the bad job starts. Uh, and uh, what we have is instead of uh, routing uh, that URL or uh, choosing a URL that's publicly routable, what we do is use the private network uh, to go through the reverse proxy service. Uh, and then uh, on the user end, you have an HTTPS that you're pointing to. So it's more secure. So to launch uh, a notebook uh, that I'm talking about today, uh, uh, so you can clone basically the reverse proxy. Uh, oh, by the way, this presentation is uh, already uploaded. So if, you're, uh, if you want to uh, download and follow along, you can actually download it. Uh, but you can clone that, and you can clone the HPC training. And if you've already done this before, because it's week four, you can just do a poll to get the week four changes. So after that, uh, it's basically a question of uh, loading uh, Anaconda and then starting uh, the Jup this start Jupyter script is uh, part of the reverse proxy service that we uh, uh, software that we have, uh, which essentially takes the arguments. It has an argument of which partition we want to use. Uh, it's a GPU shared, the account you want to use. So here we have use 300. Uh, you have to change it to what your uh, account is uh, or your allocation is. The time you want to run for, uh, 30 minutes might be too short. You can ask for a little longer, but uh, that's just an example. And then this is key. Uh, currently, the reverse proxy <coughs> uh, setup we have is mainly geared at the CPU side. So I made a little modified notebook, uh, expands gpu.shell uh, script that you can uh, invoke uh, instead of the default that you can get with the reverse proxy service. And again, this file is actually in the HPC training GitHub. So you can actually download, you will get that when you download the week four info. Uh, the only thing I would say is that if you had put your, uh, if you had cloned it in a different location, just make sure you change this path so that you point to the location that you used. 
So what would that do? So let me show you uh, like a sample uh, output when I started this. So if I do a module.gcc, anaconda3 and then do the start, what you get is this uh, HTTPS address and uh, the, string, the string that is before the expanse user content.stsc.edu is completely uh, randomized string. I mean, it takes phrases and randomizes them, but uh, and then you get a token that is also used for the authentication. So this pops up and then you, uh, and the script also submits the job and you get a job ID back. Now, if there is an error and you don't get a job ID back, you, you can check if it's because you don't have allocations or uh, if uh, something else went wrong, like for example, your Anaconda load didn't work right and you ended up with, uh, uh, no Jupyter in your path or something like that. You can see the error file from that particular run and uh, 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 see, what, see how it looks. But if everything is successful, you'll end up with a job in the queue and when this runs, uh, you actually can uh, 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 go to that website, that uh, the notebook site that gets popped out there and I did that on my case and I'm going to stop sharing at this point because I'm going to switch to the notebook page which is there and you can actually uh, uh, you should basically see uh, your your notebooks or if you uh, by default it puts you in the home directory and you can navigate to the no notebook directory which is what i did already did in this case and just to be safe i did this a little earlier because sometimes the gpu nodes get really busy and there's nothing free so uh, so i have this running so let's uh, so we have a, a bunch of uh, notebooks there so there's a computing pi, which is what I'm going to start with. And then the distance matrix is the next one I'll do. And this law of cosines is the homework you guys will have to do. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to happen now. You can do that uh, uh, offline. <clears throat> uh, and then I also wanted to go over one of these uh, uh, notebooks, which is pretty nice. It's called uh, uh, Mandelbrot set visualization that uh, Mark Harris from NVIDIA had a notebook. So that's a pretty nice notebook. So let's get started with this. So if you click on that, uh, you get a Jupyter notebook. And uh, the nice thing is there's Markdown to explain. And this, uh, this is one of the notebooks that Abe Stern used in his train, earlier training. So I'm basically reusing those notebooks. Um, and uh, basically, in this example, what we are doing is computing the value of pi uh, using a Monte Carlo approach. So what we... Uh, what we do is essentially uh, uh, do a random set of points and if the point falls within a circle, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can figure out uh, if it's within a circle or outside a circle by just doing the distance from the origin. And then you can use that to estimate pi. So that's what essentially is going on. So if you look at the next cell and if you do shift enter, it's going to execute the cell. So the next cell, what we are doing is we are importing Numba, we are importing math, and uh, from Numba we are importing uh, CUDA. But let me hit enter. So you'll see it's uh, going through that. Uh, so the next thing we have to do is basically define the CUDA kernel, which is what it, which is going to basically do the distance. So that's on the next line, and I can start explaining that. So, so what we are doing is uh, computing the norm, and if it uh, falls within uh, the circle of radius one, uh, it's true, and if it's uh, outside, it's false. Now, in this case, we are doing a very simple thing. Each uh, each thread is operating on a single point, and the point we determine uh, just based on the thread ID. So you can look at it here, and you can. Uh, uh, get the uh, uh, the in, uh, the index and basically uh, 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 you know, just based on the thread ID, the block ID, and uh, and the dimension is what we use to basically find out what the global index is, right? So you're doing the thread ID plus the block ID times the width, right? So 
and then the function all it's doing is basically a square root of uh, the x and y x square plus y square right and if it's uh, 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 and we just return basically the sum of uh, all of this uh, so uh, so actually no we return basically whether it's uh, less than or one or not and then basically we uh, do a reduction uh, function also, which is uh, basically just adding all of them. Uh, so, so that's the uh, that's the piece that will run on the CUDA uh, side. I mean, on the GPU side. So, if you look at the uh, generation of the input, so we are just uh, doing our usual. Uh, I mean, we are doing a random uh, generation, basically random number of uh, random number array, uh, but uh, dimension two, basically x and y, right? And that is that piece. Uh, and this is uh, this is happening on the CPU side. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, we are basically going and uh, uh, doing a test. Uh, that that does the simulation in uh, numpy so that's basically cpu only that's this piece here so and that's going to take a while uh, because uh, uh, because it's it's doing it on the cpu so it took about 11 seconds and we just store that timing event info Oh, so basically, we are using the time it function, and we are just doing one iteration and one loop in this case because it takes longer. On the GPU side, we can do more. So now uh, we go down to the uh, uh, GPU implementation. So we are doing an array of, on the GPU uh, and uh, basically repeating the same thing, right? So let me. So we sent the uh, the array that we had earlier, the the random number array, the p, is CUDA to device function here is basically sending it to the GPU, uh, and then uh, and then we are doing the same uh, same thing. So let's see. So the compute norm is what we defined earlier. So up here. So that's what we are uh, calling out here, the launch kernel. So this will run on the GPU. So let's do that. And in this case, we are doing more iterations uh, because it's faster and we just, we can get some uh, average info. So that finished in 1.87 seconds, but we are doing 10 iterations. So. Uh, if you look at the speed up, it's uh, almost six times faster to use the single GPU there. So uh, that was the simple example. Now, once you're done with this, uh, what I usually do is just clear the output uh, and just shut down the uh, kernel. Uh, and you can just close that browser tab, that's okay. Uh, so let's go to the next one, which is a little bit more complicated. So what we are doing here now, uh, in the previous example, we just did a single dimension, uh, uh, like the grid, uh, the block, uh, the grids and the blocks, all everything was a single dimension uh, example there. But you can actually do a 2D uh, uh, thread block, and this will, be useful in some kinds of uh, cases. So in this case, basically, we are uh, writing a kernel that computes the distance between a pair of atoms within uh, single molecules. And we are doing this for uh, all the molecules in a list, basically. Uh, so what we are going to do here is import the same things. And uh, we are setting some uh, values for the maximum number of atoms in, in the molecule. and uh, and so on, and the total number of uh, molecules is 10,000. And basically, we're setting random coordinates. Uh, so now uh, you can see that we uh, 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 
we basically created the uh, array uh, using numpy uh, and uh, we also created a result array on the device array. Uh, so now we are back to the piece that is uh, uh, that is the CUDA kernel. So that's uh, the compute distance uh, uh, piece. So now what we're doing is we are using the X thread index uh, and the Y thread index uh, uh, to actually map it to find the, um, so let me, um, so basically index it into the atoms I and J of each molecule. Since you're doing like basically all combinations in that molecule, uh, uh, you can actually index it that way so that uh, it naturally kind of uh, matches uh, the grid that you're using on the GPU, you can basically uh, index based on that. Uh, and then it's basically doing the same thing. You're, uh, you're finding the, uh, if you look down here, the way you're finding the distance is, uh, uh, you're finding the difference between the uh, uh, coordinates there uh, and uh, doing the square root. So pretty much standard thing. The only difference here is instead of, uh, in the previous example, we, ha we had a simple index which was uh, in one direction. So now we are doing the i and j and uh, using the third ID in the x and y directions to um, get the index out of it. So, uh, <clears throat> So first thing we do here, if you remember the CRDS uh, up here was uh, a NumPy array that we had uh, defined. Uh, so that's on the host. So the first thing we do here is to send that to the device. So it's uh, CUDA2 device, uh, the coordinates and the number of atoms. Uh, and then we launch the kernel, the compute distance kernel. Uh, Notice that we now have 29, 29 here. Uh, uh, so that is the uh, the X and Y decomposition and the 29 comes up because our maximum number of atoms is 29. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing. And uh, so we launch the kernel, this will run on the GPU and then we copy it back. So now there's this function here, copy to host. Uh, that copies it back. So that is the structure of what we are doing. So, oops, I think I skipped a few steps. So that's probably going to be a problem. Let's see. Yeah. So you can see it was real quick, 239 milliseconds. Uh, and we store that GPU timing. Now we do the naive uh, thing on the CPU side, right? We This is probably not the fastest thing you can do on the CPU. You can optimize this a bit, but we are doing the naive thing of just going through the IJ range in the atoms uh, for each molecule and then just doing the square root of the distance. Uh, I mean, the difference in the coordinates. So let's run that now. So notice how you're interspersing your kernel that's running on the GPU uh, with the normal Python stuff that you do. So it's uh, quite flexible in that sense. Like you could, and, and with this notebook approach, I can go change things and uh, you know work pretty flexibly uh, with the code, uh, which is really nice because when you're developing or if you're trying to uh, you know test out some things, you can. Uh, you can have a notebook and keep changing things and rerunning the same piece uh, through uh, without having to submit a bunch of jobs, right? So, so it's uh, useful from a development standpoint to kind of test this. And since you're on the back end still using all the, uh, the performance that you get from CUDA, uh, you're not losing much on the performance side of things. So let me, I should probably go back and make sure I run this from the start. So this is on the CPU side is going to take a long time because and that's why we're doing just one iteration and uh, one loop for the timing aspect of it. 
because you're going through 10,000 times 29 times 29, I think, so fairly large. So you'll see a preposterous speed up. <laughs> it's probably not fair because I think you can do a better job in uh, running on the CPU side, uh, but just wanted to show you because you can uh, actually uh, optimize the CPU side uh, to, to use some kind of uh, math library on the, uh, uh, on the CPUs like MKL, for example, uh, instead of writing our own uh, thing. So store the CPU timing and see you, you have a 200x speed up. So one thing we can do is we can actually copy the uh, uh, result that we got on the GPU back to the host. So that's what we are doing in this uh, uh, line here. You are uh, copying it to the host and then you can actually say, okay, I want to see if it's within some particular tolerance in terms of the uh, results being okay. So we're going to look through and uh, verify that the results are okay. So we match, we basically compare it to the naive computation we did on the CPU with the GPU uh, result and it's within the tolerance that we wanted. So, so I mean the key things to keep in mind is that you have the flexibility of doing both uh, a CPU and GPU programming within the same code and uh, basically very flexible in terms of where the data stays. Uh, you obviously want to optimize that, but uh, you can move things around like you saw the function that was to define a, an array on the GPU or to move data into the GPU, which is this CUDA to device function here. Um, or move data back uh, from the CPU, which is basically this uh, copy to host function there. So fairly easy to use uh, and uh, keeping the performance basically. So, oops, I managed to stop sharing. Let me see. Okay, let me go back to the, so let me actually clear this kernel and just shut down clean. And usually I shut it down because otherwise there's gonna be processes running on that GPU node, which will keep running till the job finishes. Okay, so the, uh, so the law of cosines I'm not gonna go through. Uh, is I, I can just show you what's needed. Uh, basically, uh, What's missing is this little function that you have to write. Uh, so you can uh, uh, you can look this up. So I, I have links to documentation at the end. So you can look up the syntax for vectorize and then also how you can compute the angle. You can actually see the formula that you need to use. So you can uh, fill that in and then the rest of it is just a comparison. So that's your little homework uh, when you want to try things. Uh, so let me go back here and so I can just stop that one because uh, nothing was done. So I want to go to this one, which is a nice visualization uh, of results. So, so this is an example I got from Mark Harris's uh, GitHub page uh, uh, repo on uh, basically a number example that does uh, visualizing a Mandelbrot set. Uh, which basically is, I think, z square plus c should not diverge. It's like if you take a set of complex numbers uh, and if z square plus c doesn't diverge, it's part of the set and then you can color it based on uh, criteria. So that's what this is doing. Uh, so, it's a, so it's just another example to say, show that you can, uh, uh, you can basically blend things uh, very easily between uh, stuff that's running on the CPU and uh, pieces that you want to offload to the GPU. So the import part is fine. So this first thing we do is we are uh, defining this function, uh, which, uh, uh, and we'll do one uh, setup with basically just the CPU. So now notice we don't have any of the CUDA just in time stuff. So this is essentially defined to run on the CPU. So that's the uh, function there. 
so what we are doing is uh, finding the uh, basically we have the complex number and we say that we're going to run z square plus c for some particular number of iterations and if it's uh, greater than or equal to 4 uh, uh, it's uh, it's diverging and if not we just uh, take that in uh, and we can basically return the max iterations uh, So what we are doing uh, is, uh, uh, so that's just the function that determines whether something is uh, uh, part of the set or not. And then there is this create fractal function, which uh, takes a minimum x, maximum x, minimum y, maximum y, and kind of defines the bounds of where we are checking. And, uh, 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 and then just finds the pixel size and, uh, just does the range and the coloring is basically based on the number of iterations. Uh, so you get some pretty stuff. <laughs> so let me just uh, run this through. Uh, and if you know things about fractals, they're all self-similar and you can zoom in and get the same uh, images and so on. Uh, and you can play around with this by actually changing the bounds, which is equivalent of zooming in. So this X, Y bounds here. So running this on the CPU, it took about 3.6 seconds and you can see the nice uh, visual, visual thing there. Uh, and like I said, you can zoom by changing the, uh, uh, the range. So that was very naive uh, implementation, right? We are not doing anything uh, uh, optimal in terms of even on the CPU we didn't use uh, some of the stuff we can use for optimization. Uh, so the first thing is you could do uh, uh, do this with number and just in time but not the C not the GPU. That is still useful because uh, uh, you're not interpreting this every single time so you you, you can uh, make it faster. So let's see how much faster it gets uh, by doing that. So, so one note on this example is, uh, uh, oops, I'm pressing the wrong thing, okay. One note on this example is there's a little bit of change. This is a slightly older example. So the uh, there's a reference to auto JIT. You just need to change it to JIT. And then I think some of the, some of the print formats changed. So you need to change that. But let's run this through. So now you can see even on the CPU with the number optimization, you ended up running this in 0.26 seconds. So it's almost 10 X faster. So now we go next level and say that, okay, we're going to do this, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the GPU, right? So, and we actually don't need to do anything to the code. We can use the code that we had above and say CUDA.jit, say device equals true, and then that Mandel is what the, the definition we had there. And it's that easy. So now that thing is ready for uh, 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 running on the GPU. Uh, and then we can also uh, 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 figure out which piece of the work we are doing. So you have this 2D grid of uh, uh, in your blocks, right? So you want to figure out which piece of the work each thread does because you don't want to step on some other thread and duplicate work. So what you do is you use the thread index, I mean the block dimension X and Y and the uh, grid dimension to essentially find out uh, the range that you want to, uh, where you want to, uh, pick up uh, the data. So that is that piece. And also you can actually uh, move that uh, info into the device, which is, uh, did we do that already? Or I think we're gonna do that later. So so when, when we set up the kernel, what we are doing is again, the same kind of thing. And we are saying, uh, 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 we are giving it the uh, dimensions and then uh, 
so 32 by 8 and 32 by 16 and then we are just running this kernel now so remember we redefined the kernel up here uh, this one we uh, rewrote uh, but let me go back here okay so now we are going to end up uh, rerunning this here and you can see it's running in 0 0.002 seconds so it went from 3.6 seconds unoptimized to 0.26 seconds optimized with number to like 0 0.002 seconds uh, with the gpu now one thing you'll notice is the first time you run through this it might take a little longer because uh, there's a little bit over overhead because of jit and the kernel loading uh, but the second time you run it's real quick so this is uh, the performance improvement you see so so hope i mean this is a i know this is a really quick introduction and uh, i have uh, links to both like the detailed documentation and also like uh, other tutorials which are longer that you can work through uh, uh, in my in my presentation and we can actually head back into that because I think I'm going to uh, look at okay we are here so just to summarize we went through like computing pi uh, like a distance matrix solution thing that we where we use the 2d grid and this is your homework the law of cosines and so the next and we also looked at this uh, external example uh, uh, that you can get from this github site and make the corrections that I was talking about so the next thing we can look at is uh, kupai lidar can you share your screen oh it's it's not getting shared Hold on a second. I didn't know. Okay. Does it look okay? Yes, that's good now. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is basically another uh, GPU array backend and it implements a num NumPy interface subset of it. It's a little bit more extensive than the uh, 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 Numbas, uh, 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 Numba implementation. Uh, you can, uh, actually that's flipped around. <laughs> you can use QPy with Numba, that's an option. So there is a core class which is uh, e uh, array, which is essentially the equivalent of array, and there is a function that remember we had a device uh, choice uh, function there's a device function available uh, in kupai as well to use the particular device you can actually switch it but in within your code which is nice uh, and then the function to move data arrays to the device there are, there is a similar thing that we had with uh, uh, with number you can have a similar thing to move data between devices and then there's a function to move data array from the device to the host but it supports a lot more of the uh, numpy uh, so there's basic and advanced indexing everything except for the boolean mass i think and then all the data types uh, most of the array creation and manipulation routines are supported uh, all kinds of operators with broadcasting which is essentially optimizing how it runs on the back end uh, all the universal functions except for those for complex numbers a lot of linear algebra functions because there's kublas accelerated stuff on the back end and reduction functions uh, there's also like more flexibility in terms of what you can do with the kernels you can do user defined uh, element wise kernels you can do reduction kernels uh, there's the option of using CUDA kernels and I'll talk about what this means in the example uh, this essentially lets you optimize uh, functions that you're repeatedly calling essentially uh, and then you can customize the memory allocator and the memory 
a pool which and basically uh, um, unify you use unified memory and so on and you can use the QDN and utilities so there's a, lo a lot of performance uh, enhancements so we can look at uh, uh, go back to my notebook so I will stop sharing this and share to my notebook which is this one okay so I'm going to stop uh, Stop this one and shut it down. So that's gone. Okay, so let's go to the Coupa examples. So So importing it is pretty simple. So you do a import numpy, import qpy, and that is easy. So let's uh, start by just trying to create an array on the GPU device. So, uh, so all I'm doing is test array equals qpy dot uh, a range twenty five and the shape. So you know you're doing a five by five matrix and uh, the elements are basically in order zero through twenty four. So if you had done this in NumPy, the only difference is you would have NumPy dot a range. So, uh, so it's uh, pretty simple from a syntax point of view. So we can do that and see how it looks. So you can see that the array is defined and it's a five by five shape. So if you want to test where this thing is, you can uh, figure out which device and it says CUDA device 0 so you know it's on uh, the GPU 0 um, and you can also so that was one way of uh, doing it right just defining it straight on the GPU you could also do the same definition on the uh, CPU side so this is your usual NumPy A range uh, call here uh, and then we can say uh, uh, basically use the uh, use the copy coupy function to copy it into the uh, device. So you this test underscore GPU will be on the device, and we can verify that. So you can see that we created uh, zero, uh, like a one D array of zero to fifty on the CPU or 0 to 49 on the CPU, and then uh, copied it to the GPU using this function and then printed it out. When you print it out, print out the, the function that's on, uh, which, sorry, the array that's on the GPU, it's going to copy that out and then print it. But you can see that the value is the same. And we also test it to make sure that that's on the GPU device. So it's fairly simple to you know either create it uh, on the CPU and move it or directly to create it on there. So there's some nice uh, linear algebra functions. So here on, uh, finding the uh, rank of the matrix that we generated earlier. Uh, so again, uh, these functions look very similar to what you would see in NumPy, uh, except you got the Coupy uh, uh, name there. And uh, it's pretty, pretty quickly figures that out. So that's, uh, uh, that's basically uh, the uh, the simplest thing you can do in terms of uh, creating something and then copying it into the GPU and then running some uh, functions on it. So the nice thing is uh, all these linear algebra functions are using highly optimized QBlast on the back end. So you're going to get really good performance out of it. Uh, so that. Uh, uh, so there's a whole a whole uh, lot of things you can uh, go try out, uh, and you can try this out on Expanse. So the last thing I want to do is uh, show an example uh, of a speed up that you can get by fusing uh, using the fuse option. So so here we are doing two function definitions. So one is uh, f of x uh, that. Uh, uh, 
that is essentially uh, squaring the each element and adding the element to itself and returning that and then there is a fuse uh, version of it let's see how much difference you get out of that so it's a huge uh, array that we have. i don't remember how many it's like 40 million or 4 million uh, something huge so let's time it with uh, just the uh, f of x by itself and now we are doing a coupi dot fuse uh, and actually this is uh, so the time it will actually try to kind of run long enough so it's going to this is going to run a little longer but uh, Overall, you'll see that the speed is uh, much better. So let that run for a little bit and maybe let me in the meantime okay so that's done so if you look at it uh, uh, it ran a lot longer it ran 10,000 loops instead of 1,000 loops but basically you can see that uh, it's much faster I think it's almost 4x uh, uh, yeah, or maybe three x faster uh, with the fuse uh, approach. Basically, what it uh, what happens if you don't use that is every invocation essentially turns into a kernel launch and and release. So that's a little slower than if you fuse everything and uh, cache that function. So you get like a, a lot faster response. So that that's. Very short intro on QPy. <laughs> so let me go back to my presentation and pop up the links. Uh, and I might actually just sh uh, share the whole screen so I can actually uh, pop these links up. So in terms of the documentation, uh, uh, I I just scratched the surface today, <laughs> so you can take a look at it. But basically, uh, there's info on uh, writing CUDA kernels. We looked at some of the memory management, but we didn't look at streams. For example, there's a lot of different functions where you can use streams. Uh, and there is uh, there are all these um, uh, so there's uh, options for uh, atomic operations uh, that I didn't go into, but basically you can uh, uh, you can do atomic operations. So that's a, that might be necessary in some cases. Uh, there's random number generation that's uh, highly optimized. Uh, so that will be useful too. And uh, we looked at a uh, so. You might want to go to this particular example if you want to get info on how to use vectorize for your homework and everything. So you can go to this particular example. So that's in the link. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot, host of other things that you can look at in terms of profiling and, and so on. So we, uh, I didn't go into all that. It gets a little too complicated for a first lecture, but I think. Uh, you have that. Uh, uh, this is a nice uh, uh, tutorial, which is basically a quick intro uh, kind of tutorial. And then looking at the Pi documentation, I, I want to point out a few things there also. So you don't have to bother about the install part of it because we already did that. But just to show you like all the API 
uh, I mean the number of functions that are already supported so you can kind of see uh, uh, most of these are numpy functions but basically they're all already in there so you can see a huge host of math uh, functions in there and uh, there's also like uh, some routines that are scipy compatible like uh, Fourier transforms and so on so again that makes it faster uh, if you run those on the GPU side so huge array of things so that's kind of another set of things you can look at this is more useful if you're actually writing you know code that uh, needs some of these functions and you can figure out which ones are supported and which ones are not but there, there's a lot of documentation so I think uh, that is all I had for today. So maybe I'll, uh, oh, the shared screen wasn't showing the browser. Is that right? Yeah, I guess so. Though I wasn't paying close attention to that. To that oh, thing. hold um, on, let me, <laughs> let me actually open this and So let me actually share that explicitly. So you see it now, right? Yes, now we see it. OK, yeah. So there's a uh, host of capabilities in Kupai that I didn't go through. But you can look at it uh, and pick what you need, basically. Uh, so there are all these uh, routines like array creation, uh, you know, uh, GPU. So, can we use a pointer to refer the GPU memory from CPU? I think you can use maybe unified memory. I'm not sure if you can. I'll have to check on that. I don't think that is possible, but I will check and get back to you. That was the question on Yogesh, I think, right? Yeah. So, so there's a whole host of functions. So there's linear algebra, like matrix vec vector stuff, eigenvalues. Uh, uh, basically, because Kublas is included, you can get all of those things uh, in a very optimal way. And then there's all the math functions, logic functions. Uh, uh, so it's quite extensive, uh, depending on what you want to do. And so it's a nice thing to be able to combine uh, uh, Python with uh, very optimized implementations of these kinds of functions because then you can uh, uh, code in a very simple way. And with the notebooks approach, you can actually test and uh, change things very easily. So that, that helps a lot. So in terms of uh, running on expanse, one thing I want to note is uh, uh, the, the partition I used was GPU shared. And I was using that because I was trying to uh, run longer than half an hour. Uh, so I, I had requested four hours. But if you're doing some quick tests, we do have a GPU debug node that might be quicker to get into. Uh, so you may want to try that out if you're waiting too long. We have 52 GPU nodes and they're quite busy. Like if I look now, uh, uh, sometimes they're none free, but maybe going into this long weekend, you might get a few. So right now there are 10 idle nodes. So yeah, you can probably get in if you want to test, but, uh, but yeah, in general, uh, these are busy nodes. Uh, on the CPU side, we have usually we have free quite a few free nodes, but the GPU has been running anywhere between 70 to 80 percent kind of utilization for the most part. So I'm just curious, how many of you use Python uh, extensively? I see one. <laughs> A few more, okay. So yeah, if you're uh, if you're 
using python a lot this is uh, this is a good way to get to uh, cuda and highly optimal basically all right i think uh, yeah, no, it was shorter this week, but uh, we typically do two of these presentations, uh, GPU presentations. So I, I just stuck with one, uh, one of them for today, the CUDA Python one. So hopefully it was nice. Try it out and uh, let us know if there are issues. Yeah, okay. I guess uh, we're going to have a shorter day today, which is great. Friday afternoon, take an early break. We have a three-day weekend coming up. Uh, that's why Mary Thomas wasn't able to join us. She's taking advantage of the three-day weekend uh, and left a little early to go camping this weekend. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll be putting this recording up. I've only now gotten the uh, last week's recording up, so I apologize for uh, not getting that done sooner, but we'll get this one up as soon as we can. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks very much, Mahidar. It was great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yep. And really continue computing. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks.